ejiro sine ejiro 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 gene ogene ru kewe wa sine ejiro sine ejiro sine ejiro 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 gene ogene ru kewe wa sine ejiro wa shala renda skip wa shala renda wa shala renda to you o god I will praise you, O oh Lord, I shout hallelujah. What shall I render to you, O oh Lord? Father, to you, oh, be all the glory. To you, oh, be all the honor. To you, oh, be all the praise and adoration forevermore. I say to you, Lord, hey, be all the glory. To you, Lord, be all the honor. To you, Lord, oh, be all the praise and adoration forevermore. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Happy New Month. Welcome to the monthly study for April. In the month of April, we studied a concept that I titled Exploring God's Love Languages. And in this video, we're going to be exploring together in today's study what God's love languages are, what does it mean to love God, why is it important to love God. And at the end of it, my goal is that you would come to an understanding, tangible, practical understanding of how you can begin to love God or love God more. Before we start, let us have a minute of prayer. My Father, my God, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the grace to be here. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this month of May. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for life. Thank you for, love, for your peace. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything that happened in the month of April. We thank you, Lord, for the grace even to read your word and to study it. We thank you, Lord, for wisdom and understanding, to understand what you are teaching us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, because you are the one that directs us in the word of God. We say thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Today, O oh Lord, we ask that you teach us in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask, O oh Lord, that you expand your word in our heart. We ask, O oh Lord, that everybody that is, I ask, O oh Lord, everybody that is listening to me, O oh God, will hear me in their own languages. That, Lord, never, every single thing, you know each individual person. That God, even as they listen to me, O oh God, that you give them a word, you speak to them personally, O oh God, in their lives, in their situations, in the name of Jesus Christ. That this word that I will speak, O oh God, it will be life. It will carry your power, O oh God. It will go forth with power and might in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that I will not speak any empty words. That it will not be about me, but it will be about you in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, just for this day because we've already ordained it. I ask that God never, that you know, everything will go well through this filming. There will be no distraction. There will be no disturbance, O oh God, in the environment. That everybody that is watching me as well, that God never, you give them peace and grace, O oh Lord, to listen to the end. In the name of Jesus, I've prayed. Amen. Amen. So let's jump right into it now how did this topic how did this topic come about i was on twitter um sometime in march and i saw someone a lady i think she was about to make a comment on some circular matter and then she started her, her response by giving a disclaimer and she was like yeah i love god but i'm sure that you must have heard something like that before like yeah i love god but you know, it doesn't matter if I'm cheating. Yeah, I love God, but I have needs. Yeah, I love God, but God will understand. You know, and, I, and it, 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 that thing actually touched me. I'm like, many people claim to love God. Many, I don't think there's any Christian, anybody in the world, that you ask, do you love God? And they will say, no, I don't love God. No, I hate God. Nobody will say that. Everybody loves God. Everybody will love God. Everybody will admit to loving God. But does everybody love God? Actually right i'm not trying to rhyme you know, the bible says that a time is going to come where people will come you know to him at the rapture at the last day and then they'll say lord we heal the sick on your behalf lord we give to the church on your behalf and they'll say i know you not like i think that's the scariest thing for any believer any christian is on that last day to get to that throne and then you hear christ say he doesn't know you after you've, you've, you think you've spent your life serving God. That, I don't know about you, but it scares me a lot. That God, I don't want to just serve you in an empty manner. I don't want to just serve you emptily. I don't want to just do things. I mean, I think, oh yeah, I'm serving God. Oh yeah, I'm pleasing God. And at the end of the day, right, 
is, is nothing in the eyes of God, which is why it really is really very important for us to understand, according to the Bible, what does it mean to love God. Now, before we even go into the scriptures, let's look at it as human beings in, in a secular, just secular life, right? Let's imagine a couple, husband and wife, and then the husband tells the wife, oh, I love you, I love you so much, right? But then he beats this woman, and he cheats on this woman, and he refuses to provide for this woman, he refuses to provide for her kids or her, but he claims that he loves her. He's begging every day, oh, babe, I love you, I, I, I'm so much in love with you. And she's like, yeah, if you love me, why are you cheating, you know? If you love me, why are you, always, why are you never at home? If you love me, why do you keep you know, doing X, Y, Z to me? Why is his profession of love not enough for her? If just saying I love you is okay, it's just enough, why is it that as a human being, if someone tells you they love you, but then that there's no action to back up that love, why is it not enough for you? And, you know, think about it. Because what's actually not enough? What's matter is important for people to hear that they are loved. It's not, it's not a way to profess love to people. Oh, I love you. I love my child. I love my parents. It's very important. He has his own place. But above and beyond just the profession, there has to be an action to back it up. Love as a word is not just a noun. Love is also a verb. It's an action word. So when you say, I love you, that love inside that statement has two purposes. It's a noun to make that person understand how you feel in that moment. But there's also the action that should back up that I love you. Now, again, let's look at a couple. You have a couple where, you know, let's say the wife is Chinese and the husband is German. And then the wife is talking to her German husband, but they don't understand each other. The wife is saying X, the husband is saying Y. The wife is saying A, the husband is hearing Z. What's going to happen to that relationship? There's going to be a breakdown because there's no communication in that relationship. For love to work, there has to be communication, right? There's a communication of words, and there's also a communication of action, which psychologists have termed love languages. I think there are five love languages. If I remember correctly, there's acts of service, there's physical touch, there's quality time, there is um, gifts, and there's word of affirmation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Those are the five love languages. Now, these five love languages are actually action actions five different types of actions that you can do to show someone that you love them so let's assume that again a couple the wife's love language is quality time and the husband's love primary love language is maybe physical touch for example and the husband tells his wife that oh babe i love you but he's never at home he never spends time with her they don't go on dates anymore. It's not, it's not when he calls, when she calls him, he's not picking his call. They don't watch movies together. It just doesn't stay at home. He doesn't spend any time with her. And let's not say he now begins to buy her gifts. Every time he goes out, he comes home with a gift. Every time he goes out, he comes home with a gift. But he's never at home. The woman will complain. She, well, no matter how much you know, the man is gifting her, how much he's spending buying the gifts, how much he's spending... How much time is spending looking for gifts to buy her? A primary way of understanding love has not been met. Do you understand? The man too, let's say his love language is physical touch, but his wife refuses to maybe have sex with him, or refuses to hold his hand, or refuses to hug him, or whatever. And she's out here cleaning the house, doing other things, um, doing a lot of acts of service, giving a lot of word of affirmation, but she's not communicating to him through his primary love language. You know, the man will end up feeling like, ah, this man doesn't love me. Even though she's doing all these other things. It's the same thing as well, you know, even in a relationship with God. You may say you love God, and you may be doing things that you think should communicate that love, right, to God, to show that you love him. But there are ways in the Bible in which God has said that if you love me, this is how you show me you love me. If you love me, you do X, Y, Z. These are the things that God has put down, stipulated as his own love languages, right to show for us to see and do so we can learn okay i love god i'm going to show god i love him by doing all these things i hope that you know that brief introduction really makes sense is we need to just go beyond saying you love god you know your love for god your profession has to show in your actions it's the same thing when you are born again the bible says that produce fruits 
in keeping with righteousness. You say you are born again. You say you are saved. You say you are now in Christ. But you continue to behave like people that are in the world. You continue to willfully, you know, you dress like them. You go to where they are going. You drink like them. You do things that they do. When they look at you as a Christian and they look, compare you, you to a, a, an unbeliever, there is no difference. Right? No. The Bible says that we should actually take our repentance and use it to produce fruits. The Bible also tells us that how do we recognize false prophets? It says, by their words, fruits you shall know them. God never told us to identify false prophets through their words because anyone can say anything. Anyone can profess anything. Anyone can say anything to get anything. But what people cannot really hide for a long time is their fruits, is their action. So, oh, even, in, even in real life relationships, you are dating a guy and the guy claims, oh yeah, I love you. But then you look at his actions, actually. You shouldn't just go with his words. His actions matter as much or even more than, you know, the words that he's speaking. So he loves you, but he doesn't spend time with you. He's not taking you seriously. There are no plans for the relationship. He doesn't respect you. He doesn't respect your family. He doesn't respect your boundaries. He doesn't give you anything, you know. Like, bro, <laughs> do you really love me or what are we doing here? You know, so let's go beyond... Um, just saying we love God to actually loving God as a verb, as an action. So now let's go into part two of this video, which is um, what I think that God God understands or God dictates as his love languages. Now, before I go into that, actually, let's talk about why we should love God. What's the big deal? You know, you may wonder. Now, okay, Tyler, I hear you. Beyond just words, I need to, you know, yeah, should I love God? But what's the big deal? God is just God. God is, I saw someone on Instagram say, call him Sky Daddy, right? You know, God is just there, he's big, right? What does God need my love for? Why is my love important? Let me show you some reasons in the Bible. So the first reason why we should love God, let's read Luke 10 verse 27. And I'm reading from the NLT translation. That's my favorite translation right now. So yeah, I'm using it. Luke 10, 27, the Bible says, the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this scripture actually comes from the Old Testament. It comes from Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, right? And there it says the same thing. It was when God was giving the law to the children of Israel. It says, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, it says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So the first, first reason why we should love God is because it is commanded. God commands us to love him. The same way God commands us to not lie, to not steal, to not, you know, covet someone's, someone's um, things, to not fornicate. He also commands us to love him. And do not just say, love me with your mouth. He said, you must love God with your soul with your heart and with your strength. These are three different things. I love God with my heart. That is, oh, I love God. Oh, I feel ticklish on the inside when I think about God. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, I love God. Anyway, that's you love God with your heart. You love God with your soul. It means you love God with your mental faculties. You know, it goes beyond just feelings now to, you know, the actual realm of understanding. And you love God with your strength. That means God expects you to expend energy in his love, in your love for him, excuse me. Love God with your heart, with your soul, and with your strength. Many of us just stop at the heart. Oh, I love God. I feel warm on the inside when I think about God. And that's the end. But logically, you don't love God. You don't, your love for God has not, has not done anything to your soul, to how you see the world, to how you reason things, to, to your work. Your love for God has not shown in all those parts of your life. Your love for God has not reflected in where you expend your energy. He said, love me with your, all your strength, right? Your strength, financial strength, physical strength, you know, emotional strength. It has not shown anywhere. It's just in your heart. You've not done anything. So first thing is that God commands us to love him. It's a commandment. And we know about, one thing about God's commandment is that, you know, when God says do something, you do it, right? Because it's commanded, it's expected. God is actually... Yeah, it's a commandment that God will judge us against, right? Did you love me? Did you, do, you, did you love me? So that's reason one. Reason two, why, the second reason why we should love God is because he loved us first. The Bible says in the book of John 4, 
verse 19. I'm looking at my notes uh, on, my, on, my, on my chair, my lap. John 4, 19, it says, We love each other because he loved us first. Right? Some translation says we love him because he loved us. Let me read in, um, King James. King James says, 1 John 4, verse 19. It says, we love him because he loved, he first loved us, loved us. Let me continue. It says 20 now. If a man say, I love God, but hates his brother, is a liar. Okay. So we love him because he first loved us. So that's the second reason why we should love God is because he loved us. This person already loved you, already died for you, before you were born, before you chose him, before you were aware of him. He knew that you, you would exist on the earth today. He knew that you need to be redeemed from your sins. He knew that you would need peace and joy in, on this earth. And he was like, you know what? I love this person. I will die for this person. So you guys can enter into a fuller realm of life. Right? So God already loved you. God already died for you. God already prayed, paid the price for you. The only thing you can do in response is to respond to that love and to love him back. Now, you may not wonder, it's like, it's beginning to seem like an arranged marriage. <laughs> like, you know, someone loves you, and because of that, you, are, you have no other choice than to love them back. No. This is my third point. We also have to love God because he has enabled us to love him. Before I even go into what I've already prepared, the Bible says that God wills and does in us. God first gives you the will, then he gives you the ability to love him. So, before I start going into ways to show God that you love him, don't feel condemned. Don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel like, ah, there are so many things to do to show that I love God. I can't begin to do it. No. You have a helper who is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is to do what? To help you love God. The same way his job also is to help you live a victorious Christian life, which involves, you know, loving God. Let's read Romans 5 verse 5. Romans 5 verse 5 says, it says that, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Why? Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Let me read it from Romans 5 verse 5. Let me read it from the King James translation. Sorry. Um, the Bible says, And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. So, God gave us the Holy Spirit to shed his love in our hearts. So, if you rely on the Holy Spirit, if you ask the Holy Spirit help, the Holy Spirit will do his job, which is what? To share the love of God abroad in your heart. To help you love God. To help you understand the love of God. And trust me, when you understand the love of God, it won't be like it's forced anymore. It needs to be a natural response. It will be a natural reaction. Because love of God is so, ah, <laughs> it's so amazing. Trust me, if you've, if you've ever experienced the love of God, of which we all have, even by salvation alone, but if, you have, if, if there have ever been anything else in your life, any testimony, anything God has done for you, right, that makes you feel like, wow, God really, really loves me, right? You will know that loving God back is not a duty. Loving God back is not hard. Loving God back is not a burden. That's what, that's what I'm looking for. It's not a burden. It's, it's a natural response to an overwhelming love. The Bible says that, you know, one of Paul's prayer, Paul was like, he's praying that the Holy Spirit to help us understand the height, the depth, and the breadth of God's love. We can never understand God's love. We can never fully comprehend it. That's how much he loved us. Let me share a, a very personal story with you. Um, few, a few years back, I was in a relationship with someone. And that relationship was very, let's just say, detrimental to my life and my well-being. It was not a, a relationship which I should have found myself in. But I lacked, me personally, I lacked the, when I say the strength to come out of it, not, because of, not, not, because I, not, not only because I lacked the strength, I also did not know. You see, I was being lied to. I was being deceived in that relationship. So I could, there was no even no way I could know. It was beyond me. So let, let me give a scenario. If you know someone is lying to you, right, or someone is about to kill you, 
Yeah, you have the information, you can act on it. I didn't have information at all. This person was masterfully deceiving me. So I didn't even know. I thought I was in a wonderful relationship. I thought I was in love. I thought everything was perfect. But as a child of God that I am, everything I do is always well bathed in prayer. So I was always praying about this relationship. And the more I prayed, the more I had a sense that something was up. And I remember I had a friend of mine that were fasting together and praying about the relationship. Now, a few months, it did take a long time for God to act. <laughs> In a few, very few months after I made all those prayers, I began to see the hand of God. And God took me through a series of events. When those events were happening, I did not like them. They were painful. There were many tears. There were a lot of prayer. It was really sad. I was scared. Many things happened. When everything settled, when the truth came out, when I saw what was actually happening, there was joy in my heart. Yes, I was sad that I had broken a relationship. I was sad about everything that had happened. But I had joy. That joy was that God loves me too much to allow me to enter into a deceitful relationship. I felt so happy. I felt like, I felt like the most popular person in the world. And the God of all the earth counted me as somebody worthy to involve himself in my relationship. I felt like, wow, I had so much confidence that God is looking at me. God will not allow me, you know, marry a riffraff. God will not allow me to marry someone that is going to turn my life upside down. That singular event is one event in my life that anytime I think about God's love, I always go back to that God loves me. Trust me, if I tell you the details of it, and what God saved me from. God saved me from marrying a fraud. God saved me from marrying a liar. God saved me from marrying a cheat. Like, I can't even begin to tell you how many things God saved me from. Just in that singular. It was just a single day. In one day, everything was open. The veil was open. I saw everything and I felt like, wow. Right? There was sadness. But I had joy. I had confidence. I was able to move on very quickly. Because I knew that this was a, an act of God's mercy towards me. And even after that period, I was single for about two years. I'm still single. As I was saying, I was, you know, yeah, after that period, right, yeah, I'm still single. But in all, in all this, every single day after, uh, after that, I don't have fear anymore about marriage. I don't have fear about, you know, um, oh, I married the wrong person. Because I understand now that there's somebody else that is looking out for me. That even when me myself, I'm trying to self-sabotage, even when I'm trying to go into a relationship that is not good for me, there's a God somewhere, Jehovah El Roy, who sees me, who loves me, and who is not afraid to get down and dirty with me. See, God loves us so much. God is not afraid to come down from his throne and enter into your matter. That's exactly what he did when he came down and died for our sins. He didn't just stay in heaven and say, I'm the holy God and I haven't blessed with human beings. God left his throne. And he came down on earth to get his hands dirty, right? With human beings, with everything. He came. I'm saying we don't have a high priest that is not touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Whatever you are going through now, God understands. He has been hungry before. He has been heartbroken before. He has been lied upon, lied against, deceived, captured, beaten, assaulted, uh, defrauded. What has God gone through? God has experienced, you know, Close friends leaving him. God has experienced, you know, people talking down at him. People rejecting him. We don't have a high priest that cannot understand what you are going through. Even if a human beings around you don't understand what you are going through. Even if they cannot relate to you. God, you have a God that is, ha, you have a God that, you know, is willing and able and has done it in the past and will do it again. He can come down into any situation that you have right now and get his hands dirty and sort you out. God loves you. I used to say that God loves me. Nothing in this earth can shake that understanding. I've been through too many things in my life that God has brought me from, that God has saved me from. I've seen God provide for me. I've seen God stand up on my behalf. I've seen God favor me when I don't deserve it. I've seen God open, open up opportunities for me. I've seen God bring people into my life. I've seen God protect me from harm. Hey, hey, from harm, right? That I can say it here, anywhere, take it anywhere, bring put me in front of any podium, any stage. I will tell you categorically with no doubt in my heart that God's love for me 
is real and is tangible. I want to also encourage you that if you feel like what I'm saying is strange, you've never experienced God's love, just test him. Just let me say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Just test him. Pick any area of your life now that is going higiaga. The, the, the issue is, is, is meandering, right? And I say, oh God, on this issue, show me your love. Holy Spirit, spread the love of God abroad in my heart on this issue. Let me see. Help me to understand your love. And I promise you that you will taste. You will see and you will come back and testify. That, ah, Tayo, God loves me. God loves me so much. I pray that that is your testimony in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, yeah, let's now go into the love languages. What does it mean to love God? The um, Bible says in the book of John, John 3, verse 16, it says that for God so loved the world that he gave. Right? God does love us with words of mouth alone. He did something in return. The very first thing, right, the very first way to show that you love God is by not serving other gods or idols. Let's read from Matthew 10, Deuteronomy 13, 3 to 4. Deuteronomy 13, 3 to 4. The Bible says that, Do not listen to them. The Lord your God is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart and soul. Serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice and cling to him. Let's read Matthew 10, 37 to 34. Matthew 10, 37 to 34. He says, If you love your father or mother, more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Praise the Lord. Now, loving God means not serving other gods or idols. Now, you may wonder that when 2021, people don't go to bow down to, at least most people now, don't go and bow down to other gods, literally, right? We don't have Asherah poles anymore. You may wonder, yeah, Tyler, yeah, of course, I'm not serving any other god. I'm serving just God, of course. But nowadays, we have what we call modern-day idols. What's an idol? An idol basically is anything that you look onto as a source of satisfaction, guidance, you know, help, favor, whatever. That's an idol. So, checking your star or looking at your zodiac sign, stargazing, you know, and there's, there's this thing that they tell you that, oh, today the star is in this way, so this is how this day we go. All that is idol worship, step one. Step two of idol worship nowadays is when you prioritize other people above God. When other people have a higher place in your life above God, right? And your idol could be anything. It could be your job, it could be your marriage, it could be your relationship, it could be your children, as we've seen in this scripture, it could be your parents, it could be yourself. You can make yourself an idol. You can make your peace, your own comfort. Ah, Tayo, I can't stress myself to watch a sermon of one hour. I'm just, I'm busy. But you can watch a movie of two hours. You can binge watch an entire series, you know, an entire season of Bridgerton, an entire season of Money Heist. But you cannot spend one hour to listen to a sermon, right? You can't pray for 30 minutes because you are busy. But you can be on a work Zoom meeting for four hours. It just shows where your priorities lie. So, loving God means making God the, your Lord and your Savior. Your Lord means the number one authority in your life. The number one most important thing in your life. The number one person, yeah, you know, in your life. Anything you prize above God, getting married, money, wealth, um, yourself, your comfort, your, your rest, your Instagram following, your best friends, anything that you make, that you put outside of God's control. So God cannot, God cannot give you, if God says, don't wear this, you don't obey God, what you are doing is that you have prioritized your image, how you look above God. You're not inviting God into how you dress. You're not inviting God into what you listen to. You're not inviting God into what you eat. You've, you've put those things above God. Like, God, you can handle the other part of my life, but these other ones, I've got it. It's not your business. Don't bother about it. And many Christians do this. When they're like, oh, you're a Christian, you should not wear this, or you should not listen to this. You're like, hey, I have freedom. I can do what I want. What you are basically done is you are prioritizing what is comfortable to you, your flesh, 
above God. And take a stance of the life I live now is completely surrendered to God. What I eat, what I wear, where I go, who is my friend, who I date, where I walk, where I live, every single thing should be surrendered, you know, to Christ. If you cannot boast, you cannot hit your chest and say, yes, yes, I'm completely surrendered to God. Everything in my life is surrendered to God. You are not loving God in this way. You are not loving God in this way. Number two. Number two. We love God by obeying him. Loving God means obeying his commandments. The Bible says in the book of Joshua 22, verse 5. Joshua 22, verse 5. It says, But be very careful to obey all the commands and the instructions that Moses gave to you. Love the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Obey his commands. Hold firmly to him and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Loving God means obeying God. Like, there are no, there is no, there is no further explanation. You can't say you love God and disobey him. If he says, don't go here, don't wear this, don't say this, and you do that, you are not loving God in that moment. Now, when I say loving God and obeying God, many Christians will be like, okay, how do I know what God wants me to do in this particular situation? And that's probably a whole video that I can make separately, and I'll make that. But the Bible is already God's word. Everything in the Bible is God's word. It's God's Bible says of um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. It says the scripture, all scripture is given to us for instruction. All of them, including Nahum and Habakkuk and Lamentation and Ezekiel and Revelation, every scripture in this book is given to us for instruction. My first question to you is that, are you obeying this Bible? What is God? What has God said about how we dress? Have you taken the time to go and find out? You can't claim ignorance. You can't claim I don't know when you are carrying a Bible with you. In your, I mean, now I have about three physical Bibles. I have Bible, a Bible in my phone. I have a Bible on my laptop. You have Bibles with you everywhere now. Nobody can claim that they don't know, right? Are you obeying God? God on how you dress. Are you obeying God on how you talk? Are you obeying God in your relationship? Are you obeying God at your job? Are you obeying God in your family? Are you obeying God in your quiet time? Are you obeying God you know, with your sex life? If you have one. <laughs> you know, are you obeying God in every area of your life? Loving God means obeying him. It means being attentive to what he's saying. It doesn't mean, oh, until you are, God has to tell me my year, fine, obey you. Right? You have to tell me my year. No, it means going to look for his, his instruction. It means, ah, I want to do this. Let me first go and find out what God said about it so I can obey him. That is the posture that you should have as a believer. You want to do anything. You want to get this job. You want to enter this relationship with this person. Instead of you to just pray and say, I'm not hearing God. I'm not hearing. You should first go in search of it. And in this sense, in today's age where we have Google, you can basically search and say, what does the Bible say about fasting? What does the Bible say about masturbation? What does the Bible say about dressing? And Google will do the job for you. You will see scriptures. You don't even have to be going through all the books. That's a simple Google search now. You will find scriptures that tell you those things. And you can quickly read them and pray to the Holy Spirit. And you can, from there, you can get the word of God on that matter. You don't have to be fasting and praying for three years. That's something that God will never, never, God will never answer you. Because it's already written in the Bible. So obeying God means being careful to go and seek out his instruction and to obey it. As a child of God, your goal should be not to disobey God at any instant. Remember Saul. Remember how God rejected Saul. Why? Because Saul disobeyed God. God said that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obeying God, doing what God said, is much, much more important than giving in church, than serving in church, that going to church service, if you, if you like, give a million dollars per hour. If you like, serve God all your life. But you are, you are living in disobedience. It's worthless. You are not loving God. Loving God means obeying God. Number three. Loving God means dwelling in the sanctuary. Let's read Psalm 26, verse 8. Psalm 26, verse 8. The Bible says, I love your sanctuary, O Lord, the place where your glorious presence dwells. The Bible says, book of, the next one is Nehemiah 10.39. 10, 
I hope I can find it though. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Savel, Savel, First Kings, Second Kings, Chronicles, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, okay, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. So it's after Ezra. Not three rhymes, one on one. Nehemiah 10, verse 39. The Bible says, The people and the Levites must bring these offerings of grain new wine and olive oil to the storerooms and place them in the sacred containers near the ministering priests we promise together not to neglect the temple of god loving god means dwelling in his presence dwelling in his sanctuary the bible says let's not neglect the garden of believers it means going to church going to church nowadays going to church is even easy you can go to church in your house you can sit in your house and listen to sermons you can sit in your house and play worship music and worship God in his presence because God is everywhere. But actually, we should actually still prioritize going to a physical building. Loving God means, number four, loving God means hating evil. It means hating what God hates and loving what God loves. You can't say you love God and then God now tells you that I hate this. You now say that, oh, I love that thing. You are, you are only deceiving yourself. You are not loving God. Right? Loving God means you love what he loves and you hate what he hates. If God says, separate from these people, I don't like them, you separate. If God says, don't do this thing, I hate it, you stop doing it. If God says, separate yourself from people that do these things, you separate yourself from people that do those things because you love God. Psalm 97 verse 10, the Bible says, you who love the Lord hate evil. Very simple. It's very simple. You that love the Lord. If you claim to love God, hate evil. When you see evil happening, hate it. When you see someone, you know, stealing from someone, when you see your neighbor doing something that is hateful, that is evil, you should hate that thing and correct that person. Don't turn a blind eye to evil. Someone is cheating someone and you know. Your best friend's boyfriend is cheating on her and you're keeping the secret. And you say you love God. It's not possible. Hate evil. Now, when I read it, I was like, okay, what are the things that God hates? And in Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, we see the things that God hates. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. The Bible says that there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things that he detests. Haughty high eyes. Haughty means pride. Prideful eyes. God hates pride of any form. So you are a proud person or you are friends with proud people. Or you like proud people, right? Who are your celebrity crushes? Who are your role models in this life? They are people that are proud. They are openly proud. And you love them so much. You see? Loving God means hating what he hates. And God hates pride. Number two, God hates a lying tongue. God hates lies so much. Are you lying? Are you a liar? Step one. Are you condoning lying? Do you believe in white lies? It's just a white lie. Right? God hates a lying tongue. Are you condoning lying? You have friends that lie and it's okay. You've never told them that it's wrong to lie. You've never corrected them for lying. You've never even said, you know what, I will stop being your friend if you continue lying. God hates lying lips. God hates hands that kill the innocent. God hates framing the innocent. Putting the innocent in trouble. God hates it. You know someone is actually innocent, but you lie against that person. Or you know people that lie against that person. You know people that defraud people. Your boyfriend is a yahoo boy. He's stealing money from innocent people. Right? And innocent does not mean that other people are sinless. It means that they did nothing to deserve it. That's what, that, that what innocent here means. It means that that person does not deserve what, the, what was done to that person. That's what innocent here means. So, you know your child is a yahoo boy. He's, he's a defraud, he's a fraudster. But you are, you are, you know, approving of it. You are collecting the person's money. You are not loving God. God hates hearts that plot evil. Hearts that plot evil. You know, people that, that people that strategize evil. They call you to give them advice. I want to commit this evil, but they call you. They plot the evil in your house. They are your friends, and you claim to love God. No, you, you've not hated what God hates. He said, God hates feet that race to do wrong. 
you are eager to do wrong things. You are eager to, to make a mistake. You are eager to defraud your boss. You are eager to lie. Eager to do the wrong thing. God hates it. God hates a false witness who pours out lies. You are not there, but you say you are dead. Your friend says, ah, lie for me. Lie on my behalf. Help me call my boyfriend. Help me call my husband and lie that I'm in your house. And you too, you lie for that person. You are, you are a false witness. You know, or you have people that bear false witness around you. It says, lastly, God hates a person that sows discord in a family. God, hate, God hates people that sow disunity in a family or a gathering or a unit, right? People that try and separate people, that, that sows discord. God hates it so much. Now, so these are, excuse me, these are some of the things that God hates. I want to ask you, what's your posture on these things? Do you hate them? Beyond these things, anything that God has clearly identified as a sin in the Bible, God hates it. The Bible also says that God hates unrighteousness. So God says that, oh, these are, these are the things that are sins. The Bible says that the fruit of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. God hates all these things. My question again to you is that, what, what's your posture on all these things? Do you think masturbation is okay? Do you think watching pornography is fine? Do you think lusting is okay? Do you think, um, yeah, drunkenness is okay to get drunk? Do you think wild partying, you know, orgies, they are fine? You know, do you think hostility, anger, quarreling? Are you a pepper dem person? Do you think sorcery, sorcery, checking your star, right? Looking at your zodiac sign. Do you think those things are fine? Right? Jealousy. God says that these are the things that he doesn't like. He hates them. And you say you love God. To love God is to hate what God hates. Openly. Right? This whole age of tolerance. Say, oh, yeah, I won't speak against you because I don't want... No, 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 no. God says he hates those things. Your posture should be like God. Number five. Loving God means loving his word. Loving his word. You know, this, you know, we, we may even put this along with obedience, but that's, that's separate. Psalm 119, verse 97. David says, oh, how I love your instructions. I think about them all day long. In verse 127 of the same chapter, he says, truly, I love your commands more than gold, even the finest gold. 167. He says, I have obeyed your laws, for I love them very much. Loving God, to love God, is to love his word. Loving his word means you are reading it. You are studying it. It's not on the Sunday service. It's not on the Bible study. On your own, you crave the word of God. You are reading spiritual books. And there are many ways to do this thing. On your own, when you are not doing anything, listen to sermons. Listen to spiritual songs that have, you know, scripture in them, right? And go to church, you know, sign up to a, year, a, a Bible reading program, one year, you know. You know, sign up to Bible studies, join a Bible study community like our, our own and participate. To just join is not enough, but to also participate is important. Loving God means you love God. The scripture where you love his word, sorry. The scripture where it says that I found your word and I ate them. Say, so your word did I find, and I ate them, and it was sweet in my belly. Right? Loving God means loving his word. It means prioritizing his word. It means anywhere you hear the word of God, you pay attention. I have one saying, I'm like, I like to argue a lot, and I like being right when I argue, by the way. But, I tell you that if you are ever arguing with me, and you give me a scripture, any scripture that answers that thing, I will keep quiet immediately. Because I've made sure, I've made sure that in my life, the word of God is my umpire. I don't go beyond the word of God. If the word of God says, stop here. The word of God says, this thing is wrong. No matter what popular culture says, no matter what science says, the word of God says, this is the right thing. I take that thing and I leave it there. The matter is what? It's settled. Right? 
Loving God's word means prioritizing it, looking for it, not waiting for it to come and meet you, looking for it, searching his word, taking out the time to read and to understand it. That's what it means to love God. Lastly, last before the second to the last, loving God means loving your neighbor, and everybody is your neighbor. Matthew 25 34 to 40. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink, I was a stranger and you invited me into your home, I was naked and you gave me clothing, I was sick and you cared for me, I was in prison and you visited me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hostility? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, you are doing it to me. You see, the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God means loving your neighbor. You can't say you love God, but you hate human beings. You can't say you love God, but you hate someone. You can't say you love God, yeah, but you, you hate human beings. You know, in the church, you are pious, you are nice, you are looking holy, you are crying, you are so touched, you are so moved, and you leave the service, and you get into your car, and the first thing you say to your driver is, are you idiots? You good for nothing fool. That's your love for God has gone up in the air. Smoke fizzled away. Loving God means loving your neighbors, loving mankind, treating them with respect. Now I understand that not everybody in this life is easy to love. Some people are <laughs> it's just good to love them from afar. And say, you know what? We'll see at the feet of Jesus. Some people are that problematic. But loving God means that, you know, yeah, you tolerate them. You forgive human beings. You're not thinking of evil towards someone. You're not plotting how you'll kill someone. You're not plotting how you'll be deliberately wicked to someone. You're not raping people. You're not slapping people. You are a boss at work. You're an employer. You're not deliberately taking advantage of your employees at work. You are in a position of authority over someone. And you're not learning you're not over that person. That's what it means to love God. Loving God means to treat human beings with love and respect. To forgive. The Bible says, as much as it depends on you. Live at peace with all men, all men of every shade and color. You can't love God and be racist. It's, not, it's just not possible. You can't love God and be sexist. You can't love God and say, you know, I believe. Yeah, you can't love God and you can't do that. Loving God means all men, whether they are black, yellow, white, green, gray, male or female, young or old. You can't say, I only respect the old people. When you find someone that is younger than you, you look around that person. Bible says that God is not a respecter of men, and neither should you. Everybody in the eyes of God are equal. Child, young, male, female. Bible says, Bible says that you know, in, 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 in God now, there is no male or female. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no, there's no exist. So you as a child of God that claims to love God, you can't be a respecter of men. You need to love everybody. The way you treat your maid should be the same way you treat your child. You shouldn't say, my child eats the good food, but my maid eats the trash. My child wears this clothes, but my maid does not, she likes, she does not wear anything. You are not loving God that way. Loving God means people that are under your care. You care for them as unto the Lord. You are working for your boss. Your boss is the most horrible person in this world. It's possible. I know. I've been there. But loving God means you love them. You don't plot evil against them. You do your job as what? Unto the Lord. Their God, their maker, will judge them for their wrongdoing. And lastly, loving God means feeding his sheep. In the Bible, before Christ, when Christ died and then he came back on the earth, before he ascended, right, he called Peter and asked Peter three times, said, Peter, do you love me more than this? Peter said, yes, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes. He said, feed my sheep. He said, Peter, do you love me? Oh, are you sure you love me? He said, ah. He said, God, I love you. Die. Die. Scatter. 
And God said what? Feed my sheep. Loving God means feeding his sheep. All of us receive the great commission. 18, 20 verse 19. He says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of age. Loving God means obeying the Great Commission. You can't be a child of God and you've never, you, you know, you're a child of God and you've never told someone that God loves them. Try to preach to someone. And let's say people that when people say preach the gospel, this is not that difficult. Let's demystify it. You're on social media, you're on Instagram. You have WhatsApp stories, you're on TikTok, you're on Twitter, you're on LinkedIn, you're on all these places. But what do you use them for? You use Instagram to post your picture and you're collecting likes. and am telling you, oh, you are so pretty. Oh, you are so nice. Vanity. Everything is vanity. I'm a very beautiful woman. I bless God for it. But I will get old one day. When I die, I will leave this body on the earth and my spirit will go and meet God. I'm just a body. This is just my body. This is just my physical, you know, outer cover. But that is what most of us glorify on social media. On Instagram, just your body you are showing. On Twitter, you are showing your intellect, right? And you are saying, oh God, I want to preach, but I have no opportunity. You have opportunity every day. On Instagram, give yourself a, a, a challenge that at least once in a week, maybe on Sundays, post a scripture. That's all. See, to get someone to become born again, Right? It's not your job as a person. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts. The Holy Spirit only needs an introduction. The Holy Spirit needs an avenue to enter someone's mind. That's all. The Holy Spirit needs an avenue. That's why all these things, Christian movies, Christian songs, someone's like this, right? They, 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 they play an important role in salvation. Someone may listen to this someone now and feel convicted. But then someone ends. It's the Holy Spirit that now continues that work of conviction in that person's heart. The person eventually becomes born again. So you may just tell somebody that ah, God loves you, but then you sow the seed. Between when a person heard that God loves you from you, this Spirit has been working in their hearts, convicting them, bringing repentance. And then maybe three days after, they meet someone that now tells them, become born again. It is easier for them to receive that word because of something you've told that person two days before. So to say that I'm not an evangelist, or I'm shy, I can't preach the gospel. It's not really true. Use your WhatsApp stories. Use your Instagram stories. Put it on your TikTok. You know, if you can't even put it, follow accounts, Christian accounts, like their posts, and share it on your profile. You have preached the gospel. You are doing something. If they are doing nothing, you know, you find a quote from somewhere, share it. You see a nice sermon on YouTube or somewhere, share it. You have friends that are not born again. Pray for them. Part of salvation, the work of getting people saved, there's a very important prayer aspect. All these evangelists that you see outside, missionaries, they are always supported by a strong prayer ministry. If you cannot even, you are even shy, you are not even on social media, but you can pray. Pick two people in your life now that are not born again. Or they are born again, but they are not living for God. And begin to pray for them. Once a week, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, say prayer, God, this person, Holy Spirit begin to convict this person. Holy Spirit bring conviction into their hearts. Holy Spirit bring them into contact with someone that will preach the gospel to them. Begin to pray for pastors, pray for missionaries around the world. By doing that, you are contributing to the Great Commission. You can't love God and have no part in expanding His kingdom. It's not possible. It's like saying that your father has a, a conglomerate. And I say as a child, you don't want to be part of it. You want to behave as if you, 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 you know, you are not a part of that family. What are you doing? Like you are disowning that family. You can't say you love God and be a closet Christian. You can, you do, those things, you know, they don't, they don't work well together. Loving God means feeding a sheep. means sharing scriptures. You see a nice sermon, share it. You see a song that you like. You listen to Maverick, Maverick City or Hill Song or Elevation Worship. The song touches you. Share it with your friends, with your Christian friends with your non-Christian friends. Let them call you as you. Let them laugh at you. It's persecution. The Bible says that blessed are those that are persecuted for the sake of the gospel. It's a blessing. It is a sacred blessing to be persecuted for sharing the gospel of Christ. If you don't know that, it's a blessing. You should aspire to it. The apostles, they beat them. 
And the Bible said they rejoiced. They thanked God for the opportunity to suffer for the sake of the gospel. That's the, that was the attitude of the apostles. Those, those men loved God. They loved God with their strength, even with their life. They died. They died. They paid the ultimate price because they loved God. Many of us will not have to pay the ultimate price. Many of us are not going through persecution. Many of us live in countries that allow us to practice our religion. You may never die for Christ, right? And you are still... You know, you are running away from people looking at you and tagging you the serious Christian. How is that a bad tag? How is that a bad thing? It shouldn't be a bad thing, child of God. It shouldn't be a bad thing. To love God is to feed the sheep. To love God is to promote the kingdom of God upon the earth. So you can come quickly. So we so we can go to heaven. You know, loving God means serving God. What can you do in your church to move the ministry forward? You can use your money. You can give to a missionary. You can pray. You can serve God. Go and clean the church. Join the ushering unit. Join the choir unit. What can you do to help your pastor that is preaching the gospel? You can even get tracts. I used to have one thing that I did then. When I had, when I had a car, I used, to, I, 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 I used to do this thing where when people enter my car, I play a sermon. I don't, I don't say anything. You are in my car. I'm carrying you somewhere. I play a sermon. Or I play a Christian song. Without saying anything, they are hearing. They are hearing. Without me saying anything, all Holy Spirit needs is an entrance. It may be one word that they will hear from that sermon. Maybe one thing they will hear from that song. And Holy Spirit will begin to walk. It will begin to walk upon them and they will become saved. You don't know if today this friend of yours may die tomorrow. You don't know if this friend of yours, you know, may just completely go off, off the path. You know, ten, two, two days from now, two weeks from now. You don't know if it's a picture you share today. The song you share today, the prayer you make today, that God is that just that is the last thing that needs to you know in the package to get this person saved. You don't know even if you yourself, this may be just you don't know when you die as well. You know, so loving God means furthering his mission, feeding his sheep, moving the kingdom forward. As a child of God, say, God, I love you, is asking you, feed my sheep. God, I love you, is asking you, obey my scripture. God, I love you, is saying, hate what I hate. God, I love you, is saying, dwell in my sanctuary. God, I love you, is saying, love your neighbor. Whenever you say, I love God now, let those things stay in your mind. Seven things, seven love languages. Let me run through them again from the top. Loving God means don't serve other idols. Loving God means, you know, obeying him. Loving God means dwelling in his presence, in his sanctuary. Loving God means hating what God hates. Loving God means loving his word. Loving God means loving your neighbor. And loving God means feeding his sheep. I really pray that everything I've said today brings conviction in your heart. I pray that the Holy Spirit has begun to work on your heart to this word I've, I've preached. If you have any questions, any comments, anything you want to add to this, any example you want to give, put them in the comment section below and I'll reply every single one of them. If you have any questions that I said, let me know in the, in the comment section below and I'll make a video to answer your question. God bless you so much. Today, um, the study for May is going to be out today as well. So please check your emails and I'll see you at the end of May by the grace of God. Thank you very much for watching. This is the first time here. My name is Tayo. I know I never... I didn't introduce, I didn't introduce my, myself. My name is Tayo. I am the founder and lead teacher of the Kino Professors Network. Short form is The King. The King is just a, is a um, interdenominational parachurch ministry where we believe that God has called us for a purpose. And it's our job every single day to live out our life with that purpose in mind. If this sounds like you want to know more about The King, our website is in the description box below. It should be somewhere on the screen right now. Please go to our website, you know, read about it, send us a message. And yeah, we'll, really, we'll be really willing to talk to you more about it. If you want to join the king as well, the link to join us is down below. If you want to get next month's study as well, the link to do all that is, is in the description box below. God bless you so much. I'll see you next time. Bye. Giovaiga. Hey, Giovaiga.